we have so much to be thankful for. Today, just what we sang. And seriously, if, 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 listen, we could close right now and it would have been a great morning. Just singing about our Savior, and He arose. What a blessing. Thank you, Pastor, for, for leading that this morning. Now I'm going to start with two questions this morning. First one is this. Can you imagine what it must have been like for the disciples in the aftermath of losing their very best friend? We're told in Luke chapter 24 that two of the followers of Jesus Christ, as they were walking on that road to Emmaus on that Sunday morning, Unbeknownst to them, Jesus, in a supernatural way, appears besides them. And he asks them this question. He says, why are you both so troubled? Why are you sad? And one of them, Cleopas, or Cleopas, he asks the stranger next to him, he said, are you the only one in Jerusalem who doesn't have any idea what's been going on? Are you the only one who has no idea what's happened around here? He said, we, were, we have been trusting in Jesus. We were hoping that Jesus was our Messiah. And we were hoping that our Messiah would come to, to redeem us. But he was crucified and buried in a tomb. And we just can't put the pieces together. Second question. And shaken by the cruelty of the cross and the confusion that erupted in the hours that followed his brutal crucifixion. Can you imagine the joy that came upon the disciples when they peeked in that empty tomb? Can you imagine what was going through their minds? You see, the resurrection, infidels deny it, the intellectual elite and the liberal thinkers call it foolishness. And throughout history, the resurrection has been attacked and assaulted even to this day. It's why Christians all over the world are persecuted. And it's why Christians all over the world have been imprisoned and even executed. Because of their faith in the resurrection. But the world has never been able to cause believers to surrender their confidence in the resurrection. It has always been and always will be the foundation of our faith. The church has, through the centuries, stood firmly on the bodily, miraculous resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. If Jesus did not rise from the dead, then we are no better off than the worst sinner sitting in any prison today. If Jesus hadn't risen from the dead, then the Bible is a lie and we have no hope. If Jesus did not rise from the dead, then we have no gospel to preach and no Savior to look forward to. If Jesus didn't rise from the dead, then we are, as the Bible says in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 19, then we are, as most men, all miserable. If Jesus didn't rise from the dead. Now for the skeptic, the resurrection may seem to be an insignificant issue that can simply be explained away. But for the believer, but for the believer, it is the preeminent doctrine of Christianity. It is what gives us hope. And without hope, we can't survive. And some of you here may be running low on hope after the past year or two. 
You may have lost someone who's meant very much to you. And you may still be grieving that loss. The good news is because of the resurrection, because He lives, we also can live. Jesus was raised from the dead, and for those of us who accepted Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, we'll follow him, just like he said. The Apostle Paul puts it this way in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 16. He says this, For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. That is called hope. And folks, I thank God this morning that I can stand here today and with absolute confidence and with absolute certainty that Jesus Christ is alive and seated on the right hand of God, making intercession for me and for you. According to Romans chapter 8, verse 34. Because there's a resurrection. Because of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Now again, there are skeptics out there who laugh at us Christians for believing what they consider to be absolute nonsense. They're the ones who try to convince us that Jesus didn't really die. He, he simply swooned. He was simply unconscious when they took him down from the cross. And they only thought that he was dead and they prepared him for a burial and they laid him in that cold, damp tomb. And in the dampness of that cold tomb, he revived. And somehow, he stumbled out of those wrapping uh, wrappings, and, and he pushed away the half a ton stone and he slipped out without the guards knowing it. Now, I don't know about you, but that takes more faith to believe than believing in the resurrection for me. I'd like to add, turn in your Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. 1 Corinthians chapter 15 this morning and I want to take the word of God this morning and prove to us, prove to every one of us sitting here this morning that the gospel that we love, the gospel that we share is absolutely trustworthy. Before we do, let's look to the Lord in prayer. Father, again, Lord, I do. I thank you again for the word of God because it is absolutely true. We can place 100% of our confidence in its accuracy. And as we look this morning at 1 Corinthians chapter 15, we have the Apostle Paul who's going to help make the case. He's going to lay out all of the evidence for us. And Lord, I pray that you would allow our hearts to be open, to listen to the evidence, and then render a verdict. Now, thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, this great chapter, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, reminds me of a courtroom scene. It really does. And what we have here is the Apostle Paul who's acting now as a defense attorney. And in these first couple of verses, Paul lays out the evidence for his case for the resurrection. And he lays out the case far better than any attorney or I could ever do. And, and it, as true in any courtroom... There is the placing of the evidence in either one of two categories. First of all, you have what's called circumstantial evidence. Circ circumstantial evidence allows for more than one explanation of something happening. It doesn't directly prove a key fact. So if this morning, can I use you, Steve, as an example? If Steve would come walking in here this morning and says, everybody is walking in here this morning with wet heads and a raincoat on. We would guess that he is inferring that it's raining outside. That is circumstantial evidence because there could be a secondary reason. Maybe we had a sprinkler on right outside of the front door. I don't know. 
Maybe the blow dryers didn't work. If in my case, that would be horrific. But there could be another reason why people are walking in with wet heads and raincoats. But then there's also what's called direct evidence. Now, if Steve walked in here this morning, and he's soaking wet, and he comes in and says, Rick, it is raining cats and dogs out there. That is direct evidence, because he just came in from outside, he's soaking wet, and that is direct evidence. It proves the fact of what he's saying. What the Apostle Paul here is doing in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 is proving with direct evidence. This is irrefutable testimony. Okay, can you hear me now? <laughs> Thank you, Tim. That word declare basically means to make known or to remind you of something. And for those of us, like I said, as a dad, you may have taken your son or one of your children and pulled them aside, and as I did with my son years and years ago. I said, all right, James, I want to remind you of your responsibilities around here. You may have just forgotten that this was your task. Again. <laughs> but that's what, it, that's what Paul's saying. I want to declare. I want to remind you of something. I want to declare to you the gospel. And having you have already received the gospel yourselves. And then he says that you stand on saved. I'm sorry, verse, verse 1, which also ye have received and whereby ye stand. That word stand there indicates a present stability based on a past action. And so what he's saying, Paul means by this, is when I, when I shared with you the gospel, and when I shared with you the gospel of Jesus Christ, and which was his death, his burial, and his resurrection, you received it and you believed it. And you took your stand on it. It was a foundation of which you could stand on. It was a firm foundation. It doesn't move. And you are still standing today because of it. And that alone proves that the gospel is trustworthy. But then he says that you are saved by the gospel. Look at verse 2. By which also ye are saved... If ye keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless ye have believed in vain. The verb here in the present tense, which means you have been saved and you are continuing to be delivered or rescued. 
You see, salvation is not just something that happened at the, at the very beginning. That's justification. Sanctification is something that continues to happen. As believers, we continue to grow in grace and knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. We are constantly being delivered from the power of sin. And someday, someday, we will be, when we get to heaven, I, I, I just can't wait. When we get to heaven, we will be delivered even from the presence of sin. No more tears. No more pain. No more sitting there beating yourself saying, oh, why did I do that again? The gospel is trustworthy. We are saved by the gospel. And the proof of our belief in Jesus Christ is our obedience to God. And in fact, if we're continuing to walk in your faith, it is a direct evidence of a real conversion because Jesus said in John chapter 8, verse 31, if you continue in my word, then you are my disciples indeed. If you continue in my word, you're the real deal. You're the real thing. And Paul states that they should have great confidence in the gospel. Look at chapter 15, verse 3. Here it is. He said, For I delivered unto you first of all that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. You see, the Apostle Paul continues his legal defense here of the resurrection and how, and now he clearly uh, and pointedly lays out the core elements of the gospel. And he says, listen, I have proof to back this all up. First of all, and so he says it first, this is me, first in importance is what that means. He said, we have the gospel. This is non-negotiable. It is, it is foundation for everything in our Christian life. We had the word of God to back it up. So here are the facts. Here are the facts of the gospel. And he's going to lay it out for us. And he gives us four facts in this passage of scripture. Four irrefutable facts for us to consider here this morning. Fact number one. Jesus Christ died for our sins. There's two important elements of that. Number one, Jesus Christ. Not Buddha, not Muhammad, not anyone else. The gospel centers around Jesus Christ. And the question for every one of us is this. What are you going to do with Jesus Christ? What are you going to do with Jesus Christ? You can only do one of two things. You can either, either accept him or reject him. That's the only options that you can do. And the second part of that is Jesus Christ died. That's what he says here in verse 3, that Christ died for our sins. This is a, is, is a historical fact. And we have many eyewitnesses. And folks, before you can build a case for a resurrection, you must establish the fact that there was indeed a corpse, not just someone simply in a coma. If you check the record of the four eyewitnesses that you'll read in all four Gospels, all four of the evangelists in the Gospels say that Jesus Christ died. Matthew chapter 27, verse 50. Jesus, when he had cried again with a loud voice, yielded up the ghost. Mark chapter 15, verse 37. And Jesus cried with a loud voice and gave up the ghost. Luke 23, verse 46. And when Jesus had cried with a loud voice, he said, Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. And having said thus, he gave up the ghost. He took his last breath. John chapter 19, verse 30. When Jesus therefore had received the vinegar, he said, it is finished. And he bowed his head and gave up the ghost. All four gospel accounts record give us the direct evidence that Jesus died. But if that's not enough evidence, if that's not enough evidence to convince anybody, 
Let's give you some more witnesses. Some more eyewitnesses to the account of Jesus' actual death. We call on the stand, first off, the centurion. In Mark chapter 15, verse 39. And again, it, 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 just, it plays out like a courtroom. That's what I love about it. Because the Bible is just so clear. Here's the evidence. <clears throat> Let's call our next witness, the centurion. Mark chapter 15, verse 39. And when the centurion, which stood over against him, saw that he so cried out and gave up the ghost, he said, truly, this man was the Son of God. The centurion is a Roman soldier who was a seasoned warrior on the battlefield. He had plenty of experience. He knows death when he sees it. The centurion was standing there right in front of Jesus. He was probably part of the group. He may have been part of the group that actually was part of the quaternion that was surrounding Jesus as they walked him to the cross, to Golgotha. Now I want us to get the picture. Here's the cross. Here's the centurion. He is probably standing at the knee level of Jesus on the cross. He sees him there. He knows death when he sees it. He's standing right in front of him. He watched Jesus take his last breath. And then he says, truly, this was the Son of God. You see that verb, was? It suggests it's all over. It's finished. It's done. He saw the lifeless body of Jesus hanging there on the cross. And he said, surely, truly, this was the Son of God. But there's also some other physical proof. Turn with me back to John chapter 19. John chapter 19, you have some more physical proof here. Verse 31 to 33 says this. The Jews, therefore, because it was the preparation that the body should not remain upon the cross on the Sabbath day, for that Sabbath day was a high day, besought Pilate that their legs might be broken and that they might be taken away. Then came the soldiers and break the legs of the first and of the other which were crucified with him. But when they came to Jesus and saw that he was dead already, they break not his legs. Question. Why would they break the legs of somebody already hanging on the cross? You see, it wasn't to add to their agony. It wasn't to add to their pain and misery. The answer is because they wanted to hasten their death. As it says here, they wanted to be done before the Sabbath. They, the Sabbath is coming. They didn't want to have to do any work on the Sabbath. Now, again, most historians agree that the majority of the people who died of crucifixion didn't die from the loss of blood, but they died from suffocation. And if you break the legs of the victims on the cross, they would not have the ability to push themselves up to give their lungs the capacity to breathe. They couldn't catch their breath. So to help speed up the process, let's break their legs so they can't push up anymore. So the soldiers break the legs of the other two who were hanging there beside Jesus. But when they come to Jesus, they see that he is already dead. There's no reason to break his legs. He's already gone. And then there's two more eyewitnesses I'd like to give you. I'm going to call Joseph and uh, Nicodemus. To the stand. Look at John chapter 19, verse 38. And after this, Joseph of Arimathea, being a disciple of Jesus, but secretly for fear of the Jews, besought Pilate that he might take away the body of Jesus. And Pilate gave him lead, leave. 
He came therefore and took the body of Jesus. And there came also Nicodemus, which at the first came to Jesus by night and brought a mixture of myrrh and aloes, and about a hundred pound weight. Then took they the body of Jesus and wound it in linen clothes with the spices as the manner of the Jews is to bury. Now Joseph of Arimathea was a secret follower of Jesus Christ. But Joseph of Arimathea comes out of the closet now and he identifies himself as a follower of Jesus Christ. I'm sure there were a lot of closet followers of Jesus Christ back in that day for fear. And to be honest with you, there's still a lot of closet followers of Jesus Christ in our world today. But Joseph musters up the courage to go to Pilate and he asks for the body of Jesus Christ. And Mark chapter 15, verse 43 tells us that Pilate, as Joseph comes, Pilate asks one of the centurions who were sitting there, and he says, if, is Jesus indeed dead? I've got this man who wants the body. Do tell me, you were there, is Jesus indeed dead? And the centurion says, yeah, I was there. He, I saw him take his last breath. He is no longer here. Now, this Nicodemus is the same Nicodemus that we read about in John chapter 3, verse 7, where Jesus is talking to him. Nicodemus wants to know, hey, how how does one get to heaven? And in John chapter 3, verse 7, Jesus looks across at him and says, ye must be born again. That's the same Nicodemus. So Paul states a fact here. The first fact is that Jesus Christ died for our sins. And I have given you irrefutable evidence. Let's look at fact number two. Back to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. And we'll stay here for the rest of the day. Not the rest of the day, but the rest of the message. You understand what I meant. meant. I'm not that long-winded. Maybe sometimes, but 1 Corinthians chapter 15, he states the second fact, verse 4, he was buried. And that he was buried and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. You see, these two men that we just read about, Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus, they take the body of Jesus Christ. And they wrap the body with small section of cloths called swaddling clothes. Sound familiar? They wrap the body of Jesus and they, they tuck in costly herbs and, and spices in the cloth to help overcome the stench of death. The point is, folks, Joseph and Nicodemus would never have embalmed the body of Jesus Christ if there had been any sign of life. They're touching the body. They can tell that the body is now cold. They can tell that the body is lifeless. They can tell that rigor mortis is finally setting in. He's been dead now. So the centurion said that he was dead. The soldiers confirmed that he was already dead because they didn't break his legs. It was confirmed to Pilate by another centurion that Jesus was already dead. And Joseph and Nicodemus together laid Jesus in a borrowed tomb. They had until 6 p.m. to get him ready. It was 3 o'clock when they took him down. They have three hours to get him ready before the Sabbath. So they're hurrying, trying to wrap him and get him in the tomb. That's why the women didn't come the next day, the Sabbath. They waited until Sunday. The Bible tells us in Matthew chapter 27 that the religious leaders were so concerned because Jesus had told everyone that he would rise again on the third day. That they commanded that a half-ton stone be rolled in front of the tomb 
and, and, and that they, they, they would seal the tomb, make sure that it's no way to be opened. We'll be able to judge if anyone's tampered with it. Seal the tomb. And oh, by the way, let's put soldiers in front of it for 24-7 because we don't want anybody, none of those disciples to come and take him out and take the grave and take the, the body out of the grave so they can walk around and try to prove that Jesus rose. We don't want that to happen. That would be worse. So they stationed the guards 24-7 because they didn't want the body missing. The fact number two was, indeed a fact, he was buried. Which leads us now to fact number three. But he rose again. In verse four again, and that he was buried and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. Folks, understand this. Buddha's grave is still occupied. Mohammed's grave is still occupied. What makes Christianity distinct and true is that the Messiah is no longer in that grave. His bones have never been found in Jerusalem. And they never will be. One commentator said this. He said, if they ever find the body of that dead Jew, Christianity crumbles. But his skeletal bones have never been found in Jerusalem and they never will. Why? Because he is risen. Just like he said. No one is ever going to find, oh, we discovered finally the bones of Jesus Christ. Not going to happen. Because he is alive. And sitting on the right hand of God, making intercession for me and for you. The rock-solid foundation of the Christian faith is the empty tomb. One commentary put it this way. He says, praise the Lord, we have an empty tomb. It is a glorious fact that the empty tomb tells us that life for us does not stop when death comes. Death is not a wall, but a door. An eternal life, which may be ours now by faith in Christ, is not interrupted when the soul leaves the body at death. We live on and on because he lives. We shall live also. Folks, every one of us who know the Lord is our personal. We have hope. Because he lives, we too shall live. Now the Bible tells us in Matthew chapter 28 that very early that Sunday morning, there was a great, great earthquake. And that stone rolled away. That half-ton stone rolled away and an angel of the Lord comes down and sits there. And on that early Sunday morning, Mary Magdalene and Mary, not knowing that the half-ton stone was there, they come to continue the process of taking care of the body of Jesus Christ. You see, they're walking there not knowing that the stone has moved, and they consider it's blocking the entrance. And now what you have is a dead body and a loss of hope. Now, see, you and I can look back on this with 2020 vision because we read the book. Put yourself in their sandals. They're walking to a grave, assuming it's still full. From their vantage point, there is every sign of death. The cold corpse, the body that's wrapped in mummy-like fashion, lying on a cold and hard slab in a hollowed-out tomb, and in fact, you could see it today. Char and I, in our trip to Israel years ago, we walked into what is believed to be the tomb of Jesus. And you want to know something? It was still empty. We didn't peek in, we walked in. But the angel of the Lord looks at these two disheartened women and he says, fear not. I know you're looking for Jesus. 
He's not here. He's risen just like he said. Now, go back and tell the disciples that. Go back and tell the disciples that. And folks, when Jesus cried out to tell us die, it is finished. The word means, again, as we said on Friday, the word means paid in full. The payment that God demanded for the penalty of sin has been paid, and the resurrection of the empty tomb is our receipt. All you have to do is go look. He's not here. He's risen, just as he said. <clears throat> so fact number one, Jesus Christ died for our sins. Fact number two, he was buried. Fact number three, he rose again. And let me give you fact number four. Because now we're going to call a whole bunch of more eyewitnesses. Verse 5 says this. And that he was seen of Cephas, then of the twelve. After that he was seen of above five hundred brethren at once, of whom the greater part remain unto this present, but some are fallen asleep. After that he was seen of James, then of all the apostles. And last of all, he was seen of me also as of one born out of due time. Now, the Apostle Paul, in conclusion, now this is his conclusion in front, of the, in front of the jury here. He's got his conclusion arguments here. He said, I have one more piece of irrefutable evidence to share with all of you. He says, I have a bunch of eyewitnesses that I'm going to call, and you cannot discount the testimony of eyewitnesses. And he starts naming names. And he starts off with Cephas. We know him as Simon Peter or Peter. Now the Bible tells us in John chapter 20 that Mary Magdalene came to the tomb early that Sunday morning and the angel told her, go and get the disciples and tell them. She sees the stones rolled away and she heads off running. She then runs back and she finds Peter and John, Cephas. And she says, I don't know what's going on, but he's not in the tomb. Somebody must have stolen him. And again, Peter and John standing there. And now there's a race. There's a race to the tomb. And it's really, it's funny to, to read it. But the one gets there first. I think it was John. John gets there first. But John stops when he gets there, and he just peeks in. Peter, no surprise. <laughs> Who's right in? Because that's Peter. He walks right in. The stone's moved. John's looking in. Peter walks right in. But allow me to share something that I found interesting as I study for this again this week. I want us to understand something. Jesus did not need that stone moved to get out. You see, he had a resurrected body. He could have done whatever he wanted. The stone wasn't moved so that Jesus could get out. The stone was moved so we can get in. And we can get in and see. That's why it's moved. So we can go in and see. The tomb is empty. And that's what happens here. So John peeks in and sees the linen wrapping lying there. But Peter actually goes in the tomb. And when he gets there, and, and listen to how John describes it in, in John chapter 20, verse 6 and 8. He says this. Then cometh Simon Peter following him. And went into the sepulchre, and seeing the linen clothes lie, and the napkin that was about his head, not lying with the linen clothes, but wrapped together in a place by itself. Then went in also that other disciple, which came first to the sepulchre, and he saw and believed. There it is, folks. There it is right now. He saw and believed. It finally clicked. 
It all makes sense now. All of the pieces of the puzzle have been put together and everything is crystal clear. That's what happened to John. The best part of this is not that he saw. The best part of this is that he believed. Finally clicks. Just what he's been saying. And I'd love to think in my mind as John looks over to Peter and says, he's risen. He's risen just like he told us. And that's what happened for me back in May of 1979 when I saw what the Word of God said was true about me, a sinner lost, needing of a Savior, and I saw that it was true, and I believed. May of 1979, Monday night, May 14th, and I believed. 43 years ago, almost. The same thing that happened to John is the same thing that happened to Rick. And any man be, being Christ, he's a new creature. Old things pass away, behold, all things become new. It makes sense to them now. They believe, Paul says, and he was seen of Cephas. But then he goes on. He says, I got more witnesses. I got more eyewitnesses. He says, he appears to the twelve. This is literally, not figuratively. He appears to the disciples, but we know that Judas and Thomas are not there. So it's like he's saying he appeared to the group. We know that Judas and Thomas weren't there. But then he goes on, he says, and then he was, he was seen by more than 500 brethren at the same time. More than 500 folks, the people there. And again, there's no way that this could have been a hallucination or any kind of deception. Paul says, in fact, listen, in fact, most of those people who saw him are still alive today. He said, some of them have died, but believe me, you can go and check with them. Ask them. They'll tell you. They saw him. And then he says, and James. James, this is the half-brother of Jesus Christ, who according to John chapter 7, verse 5, didn't really believe that his own brother was the Messiah. In fact, in Mark chapter 3, they tried to stop Jesus from doing the things because they thought he was crazy. But now James is convinced that Jesus, his brother, was the Messiah. Then he goes on and says, the apostles, Paul says. The apostles. And if you go back to the book of Acts chapter 1, you will read that for 40 days, Jesus kept appearing to them over and over and over them and teaching them concerning the things about the kingdom. And finally, Paul says, hey, I got one more witness for you. I got one more eyewitness for you. Irrefutable evidence. Last of all, he was seen of me. That's what the Apostle Paul says. There's one other name, and I need to tell you, he appeared to me also, and I can tell you the exact place on that road to Damascus where I saw him. I can take you there right now. I saw him. Folks, there were more eyewitnesses to the resurrection of Jesus Christ than the signing of the Declaration of Independence. Yet nobody doubts that that document was signed. Why is it? Why is it that the world has so much trouble with this piece of history? Well, let me rephrase it. Why is it that the world has so much trouble with his story? Jesus met with all of these believers. And then he says in Matthew chapter 28, verse 19 and 20, he says, okay, now. Now it's your turn. Now it's your turn. You go and tell the rest of the world. You make contact with those who don't believe because you have seen and believed. And folks, if you're here this morning and you have never placed your trust in Jesus Christ to forgive you of your sins and to give you eternal life, I, I'd like to ask you a question, if I may. What are you going to do now with all of the evidence that we looked at this morning? What are you going to do now with all of the evidence that we presented this morning? You're free to 
ignore all of the evidence and die in your unbelief and you'll face a very frightening future. Or you can look at the evidence and you realize that the Bible is indeed true. Just look at the evidence yourself and render a verdict. The gospel is trustworthy. The gospel is life-changing and truly, truly worthy of our consideration. So in this court scene, in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, you've heard the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth about Jesus Christ. And now it's up to you to decide. It's up for you to decide. Will you accept the evidence that has been given to you this morning? Or will you reject it? John chapter 1, verse 12 says this, But as many as received him, talking about Jesus, to as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. It's your call. What are you going to do with the evidence that we shared? Let's pray together. Every head bowed, every eye closed, please. Again, you may be here this morning and you have already received the gospel of Jesus Christ and how he had a miraculous birth and lived a sinless life and died a cruel death on the cross of Calvary, was buried and rose again on that third day and you called upon him to be your Lord and Savior. For Romans chapter 10 verse 13 says, For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. If you're here this morning, and that has happened to you. You have done that in your life. I would have liked to acknowledge that now. Every head bowed, every eye closed. No one looking around. This is a wonderful private time. But if you have received the Lord Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, there was a point in time in your life where you called upon him to be your Lord and Savior. Would you simply raise your hand and say, yes, Rick, I've done that already. Yes, Rick, I've done that already. I'm not ashamed to acknowledge the fact that I'm a Christian. Thank you for that. Appreciate that. And again, with every head bowed and every eye closed, there were some who couldn't raise their hand at that time. But after hearing the truth of the gospel of Jesus' death, his burial, and resurrection... Perhaps you're sitting here this morning saying to yourself, you know, I just don't know. I just don't know if I've ever done that myself, personally. But after hearing the evidence that you presented here this morning, Rick, I'd like to do that this morning. If that's you this morning, if God is working on your heart, I would like to pray for you. Because I understand that because it happened to me 43 years ago. When I sat there in that church on that Monday evening, not knowing for certain had I accepted the Lord as my personal Savior, and I raised my hand and said, I want to know more about the gospel of Jesus Christ. I want to be a child of God. If that's you here this morning, if you've never done that, would you please signify by raising your hand? Again, no one looking around. Every head bowed, every eye closed, no one looking around. All right, let's pray together. Father, again, Lord, I do. I thank you so much for your goodness to each and every one of us. I'm thankful for the word of God that says, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. That whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Lord, the greatest gift ever given, but it has to be received. It cannot be rejected. So, Lord, I pray that you would help each and every one of us understand why today is so special in our lives. Because he is not here. He is risen. Thank you for that. In Jesus' name, amen.